Hello and welcome to the Global Institute of Church Management's webinar series on financial transparency. I'm Pia De Saleni, President and Executive Director of the Global Institute. In today's webinar, the fourth in our series, we're going to be discussing financial transparency for parishes. I'm honored to have an expert panel to examine our topic. We are joined by Archbishop Gilbert Garcera from Lipa in the Philippines, where in addition to COVID, I just learned he also has to confront the challenges of okay, occasional volcanoes. So I think that puts the rest of our challenges in perspective. Uh, thank you for joining us, Your Excellency. We also have Dan Salucci, the Executive Director of the Leadership Institute, and Bill Bojan of Integrated Governance Solutions. We're gonna follow our customary format of question and answer dialogue between myself and the panel. At the end of that, I will invite each participant to give a brief two minute final remark. Then there will be time for questions from the public. So I'd ask you to use the Q&A option at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit questions during the webinar. We will do our best to get through all of the questions. And I just wanna underscore that any questions submitted via chat will not be taken into account. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you about next month's webinar, Financial Transparency for Religious Orders, on April 8th at 4 p.m. Rome time. You can register at the GICM.org website or at the PCM website. We will be joined by Sister Patricia Murray, the current Executive Secretary of the International Union Superiors General, Father John Harhager, uh, the Vicar General and Bus Bursar General for the Society of Mary, and Father Carlos Raul Balderas Ramirez, the Vicar General for Siervos de Jesus. We're gonna round out our series on transparency in May with a look at financial transparency for Catholic schools. We hope you can join us. Also, I'm very excited to announce that we've partnered with EWTN to offer a five-part reflection series on St. Joseph, which will air next week on EWTN. Please check EWTN's website for local times. We will also host the series on our website, the reflections are given by His Eminence Cardinal Peter Turkson, the P first prefect of the dicastery for, promote, the promo, for promoting integral human development at the Vatican, Father Robert Gall, the vice chair of the program of church management in Rome, Father Christian Mendoza, a professor for the same program, and Father Guy Noel Kukram Chapta, a graduate of the PCM program in Rome, and Father Scott Borgman, the judicial vicar for the Diocese of Orange in the United States. We hope that these reflections will enrich your personal experience in this first ever year of St. Joseph. And in other good news, enrollment is open for PCM's fifth edition in Rome. It starts on September 2021 and finishes in May 2022. You can find information on the PCM website and the link will be posted in the chat box for this webinar. We also have the dates for the um, September executive sessions intensives posted. And we are moving forward with these, optimistic that we will, that the pandemic will have abated and we will be able to gather together in person. Starting the conversation today, I'd like to turn to Archbishop Garcetta. Like myself, Archbishop Garcetta is an alumnus of the program of church management. He has attended the executive intensive weeks along with some members of his leadership team. The Archbishop opted to do a capstone project based on a survey of parish finance councils to assess their competencies and behavior. Archbishop, could you give us a brief summary of your project and its findings? Uh, I wish to give a background of uh, what happened last uh, 2020, 2019, September, and also February of last year, 2020. Uh, the three of us, two of my priests, Father Mike Samaniego, and Father Oscar Andal. We were in Rome and we attended the program for church management at the Pontifical University of Santa Croce. And we were given a capstone project, particularly on financial management. And we thought of a beautiful um, title, which is Responding to Post-COVID Financial Scenario, a pastoral program for synodal church in the Archdiocese of Lipa, Philippines. Just to give you a background of our archdiocese, last year we were devastated by the eruption of Taal Volcano. And by March, well, you know, the experience of COVID-19. And uh, it has destroyed not just uh, the plantations, 
the vegetations, even the life of people, of our people here in the Philippines, particularly in my diocese. So we have to evacuate them. And you know, the effect of COVID-19, the effect of the Tal volcano eruption, and uh, the financial fluidity in the archdiocese, it has affected. And the capstone project is an, our attempt to give a response to what can we do after post-COVID or even during this time? And we thought of synodality. Uh, you know, synodality is a terminology of Pope Francis of listening, trying to know the needs of people and try to anticipate very important uh, management way of how we can be livable and again, be responsive to the pastoral needs of our people. So this is the, 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 the background of that. And, uh, and uh, the, the program for church management, I suppose by me, I'll be presenting the whole, pro the pro whole project, the capstone project on this title, responding to the post-COVID financial scenario, a pastoral program for synodal church in the Philippines. We will be tapping our finance council and uh, part of it is the formation, part of it is the assessment of our financial resources, and even how we spend our money here. So more or less, we are already finishing the, the project, and this will be presented by May, uh, the three of us, Father Mike Somaniego and Father Oscar Andal. By the way, Father Oscar Andal is our legal uh, uh, canon lawyer, and Father Mike Somaniego is my finance officer. So it's really a team, uh, myself as a bishop, uh, the finance officer, and the uh, personal officer or the civil or uh, the uh, canon lawyer. So more or less in a nutshell, Pia, this is our, our project which we are going to present to the Pontifical University of Santa Croce. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, maybe I can turn to Dan. Dan, can you just briefly describe for us how you would define financial transparency for parishes? I, you've worked with countless uh, numbers of clergy across the country, many of our bishops in the United States. I, I mean, if, if anyone's an expert on this, you are, even though you're not a pastor wearing a collar. So thank you for all of your service. And I would love to hear from you just what you think, how would you, what does financial transparency look like? Sure, Pia, thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction. And I, I think if I were to sum up uh, financial transparency for parishes, I think, and really for the church in general, I would kind of use three things that I think really we have to be thinking of. Financial transparency is first and foremost actually a mindset. Uh, oftentimes we want to talk about the structures or, or skills related, and those are very important. But I think if we're lack, lacking that fundamental mindset around financial transparency and why financial transparency I think we're missing a big, big piece. So when I talk about a mindset, I'm talking about the fact that financial transparency is not something being imposed by the business world. First and foremost, it's constitutive to our call and identity as, as leaders in the church. Um, you know, teach, sanctify, and govern is the threefold office of a bishop or a priest. That governance, that holy ordering, financial transparency is a big part of that. Um, so if we're, if we're starting from a place of thinking this is some type of external pressure put on top of us, I think we're missing something. Likewise, I think we have to really be thinking about transparency as to why money is being used. Archbishop just mentioned that. So in that mindset, we really have to make sure that the mission is driving our use of funds and we're able to tie back to that. Um, I think from a skill set standpoint, it is very important that we have confidence um, and competence to ask the right questions, to know what we're looking for, and also to maybe dispel some assumed constraints related to financial transparency that we can't me uh, measure certain things. And I know Bill will talk a, a little bit about this, but we can measure a lot. Um, we can report on a lot. We can raise people's visibility a lot. And those, there's a lot of skill sets that go into that. Archbishop mentioned formation. And again, that formation is both on a mindset as well as a, a skill set and a training. The last thing I'd say about financial transparency is I, I believe it's a covenant. I believe it's really a commitment um, um, among our, our clergy, but also among the lay faithful in our parishes to, to have a, a set of articulated um, and common expectations around uh, what, what our funds are supposed to be used for, um, how they're going to work. Um, and, and we have to really be very uh, overt, I would say, about articulating those expectations. You know, sometimes we compare a parish 
people will say, well, it's not a business, it's more of like a family. Well, even in our families, we, we need to be transparent about uh, our resources at our funds and have a, a really a set of expectations, uh, you know, between a, a husband and wife, for example, around how we're going to be investing and spending our resources. So again, I would say financial transparency to me is, is a mindset first and foremost. It's certainly a skill set, um, but it's also a covenant uh, between all of the people in the church and really understanding these gifts that God has given us. How are we to steward them? Thank you so much, Dan. I want to turn quickly to Bill Bojan. Bill, your background is um, you're an expert in governance solutions. I mean, you work for Integrated Governance Solutions. We we're really for fortunate to meet Bill um, kind of happenstance at the launch of Global Institute of Church Management. It was a virtual launch and he happened to he asked some really provocative questions and we're very excited to be beginning this this friendship with Bill. And we've got to find out a little bit about the work that he does in parishes implementing the principles of governance that he does in his day job, so to speak. Bill, would you be able to um, share with us some, what are some of the good governance principles that parishes need to adopt in order to be more financially transparent? Thank you, Pia, and thank you for allowing me to be here and, and being with all of you on the panel. Um, so first of all, I, you know, just a simple definition of transparency that, that I like is just um, it's an honest way of doing things that allows other people to know exactly what you're doing um, or maybe bring things into the light might be another way of looking at it. Um, as I, uh, to, to answer that question, because I look at governance and I can, I can talk more about this as we, as we go on, but uh, I find both in the, the secular world, um, but, but uh, very importantly within the church, I really have found that good governance centers on, on three main things, leaders of virtue, cultures of trust, and structures of integrity. Um, let me just take one minute on, on, on to, to explain that. Um, leaders of virtue, by the way, in the model of, of Christ, um, the, the cardinal virtues, the, the supernatural virtues, um, cultures of trust in the model of the Beatitudes, and good leaders of virtue help build strong cultures of trust. Um, and I have found, and I, I teach this even to, to to secular businesses, there, there's four ingredients to, to a good, strong culture of trust. Stewardship, integrity, accountability, and transparency. Um, my experience is you build them in that order. You have to start with, to pick up on what Dan said, a mindset of stewardship. Then you have to have a commitment to integrity. Then accountability are those mechanisms and things that we can hold ourselves accountable and, and, and hold an organization accountable. And transparency is how others know, maybe outside the organization. So I think you need to build in that order of stewardship, integrity, accountability, and transparency, but you actually sustain it by transparency going up. So in other words, good transparency helps sustain accountability. Good accountability helps sustain integrity and integrity helps sustain stewardship. And then finally, on the structures of integrity, which really should follow the model of, our, of the Holy Trinity. And in there, there are, there are roles of oversight, which our bishop and our boards of our parishes play. Execution, which of course is, is the primary responsibility of the pastor. And then, and then good governing systems have what I call verification mechanisms. I believe our council structures, our parish council, our finance council, um, can play that role. So we'll, we'll talk a bit more about that, but how all that fits together and where I see the weak points um, in today's parish governing structures. But it really all comes down to leaders of virtue in the model of Christ, cultures of trust in the model of the Beatitudes, and structures of integrity in the model of the Holy Trinity. Thank you, Bill. Archbishop, if I could return to you. Um, one of the things that I really enjoyed in our conversation last week when we were preparing for the webinar was your description of how you prepare priests to be transparent. So maybe if you could share that with us, that would be very helpful. Yeah, before, before sharing uh, my, my point about the preparation, I would just like to define transparency from church management. And I would call it a spirituality of transparency, which has four points. One, it's relational. Second, God has entrusted to you responsibilities or gifts. 
Number three, it's Christological because you're accountable to Jesus alone. And of course, the bishop to the bishop to whoever you are accounted, uh, accountable to. And lastly, new mythological. So I explain number one, that when you say transparency, it's between you and God. For the parish priest, between you and God who chose you to be a minister, for a bishop too. So when we go to the pastoral council, you have been entrusted by the parish to take care of the resources. And definitely it's your relationship with God and how you're using material resources, financial resources. Number two, for those entrusted in the parish, I think we have to be grateful because of the so many participants, parishioners, you, you, you are the only one chosen by the parish priest or by the people to take charge of the resources. So you have been entrusted to take care, to be an administrator, to be a steward of a gift given to you by the Lord. Thirdly, it's Christological because you know the church is the body of Christ and we move according to the body of Christ. And relationship-wise, it's the body of Christ composed of the bishops, lay people, the priests, the religious, and everybody. And the, the, the Christ is related, and we are related to. And lastly, pneumatological, meaning to say the Holy Spirit. Because in every decision, whatever we do, be it financial, be it in material resources, we have to discern of what is really the will of God. It is not just a matter of spending or whatever you do with the money, you have to discern if this is for the good of the people of God, for the pastoral work of people. Bottom line of that is to bring people to Christ and to encounter Christ. Again, relational. So I go to the spirituality of, of what you call transparency with these four points, relational. In any relationship, in any relation, be it bishop and priests, priests and people, husband or wife, transparency is very important. I go to the question which you have posed, uh, Pia. It's how I prepare seminarians. Usually, I test in two things I, I do for seminarians, particularly for theologians. One is, if they're already in the third or fourth year theology, I would ask them to submit to me a monthly matrix of how they spent the money how much money they receive from their parents. And when you look at the matrix, then I notice that I determine the values. How come that you've been going to restaurant, eating? And how come that you don't even buy books? And how about charity? You, 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 in your matrix, I don't see any, any point that you are charitable. So this is one thing that, uh, an example, of how I, I, I do, I train my seminarians. The second point is usually I test them. I give things which uh, extra will be during Christmas. And I've been observing seminarians if they just get and get things which they don't even need. So I tell, I tell them, you know, do you really need that one or just getting something because you like it, but you're going to use it? So these are the two points, Pia, uh, in my experience as a bishop, testing especially poverty, testing about how we are preparing for transparency of our seminarians. Thank you, Your Excellency. I think, and they're important points that I think all of us can implement in our lives. Um, Dan, maybe if I can turn to you for a moment, I'd like to, I think we've done a great job of laying out kind of the principles here. What I'd like to turn to is some of the more practical. and. The church around the globe has suffered many crises, and given your experience, I mean, I know your focus is mostly in the United States, but what does a parish do to begin to rebuild trust so that you can have the, the accountability and the transparency that we're looking for? I mean, if trust is broken, how do we re begin to replace that? That's a really great question and a big one, uh, for sure. I, I think, um, you know, uh, I think I really like Bill's um, words around leaders of virtue. 
I think one of the things that can help repair trust is vulnerability. And so um, what I see is especially uh, pastors coming into situations where there's been um, a, a lack of trust or pastors who maybe have caused it or been a part of it. I think really kind of emptying themselves and putting themselves out there or, or the staff, whoever's in, involved to, to really be open to the feedback, to listen, it's painful, but I think sometimes we don't sit in the pain enough to allow us to get to the learning. Um, and I think we've seen that over and over. I mean, I think in the sexual abuse crisis, but I think in, in crises around financial mismanagement or malfeasance, um, there's also a, a violation of, uh, of the community. And I think we have to kind of sit in that for a little bit. I mean, I think one of the things that we're so blessed with in our faith is confession. And um, I, you know, I think there's a, there's a part of confession that I think is really wise, a lot of it that I think is really wise, but having to, to share your sin with somebody face to face, there, there's a bit of having to really think about it um, and, and make amends because you have to kind of have that. So, so I think part of it is vulnerability, a, a big thing. I, I think the other thing is um, honestly not spending so much time worrying about the messaging or the words and really focusing on the actions. Um, people will only really believe when they see, unfortunately. And so, um, and so we have to really have a strong plan of action to rebuild trust, not just words or talks around it or why it's so important. Um, although that, that, you know, that helps too. So having a really detailed action plan um, after you've really listened and sat in the pain of the broken trust. Um, and then I think reporting back, you know, we have, we all have short memories. So sometimes, um, and you know, for our parishioners or uh, just uh, folks in our parishes, they're coming in and out. They're not necessarily paying attention to hard work that is being done. And so it's not tooting your own horn to remind people that we are doing certain things uh, because we said we wanted to do this, right? To kind of really draw the connection points for them. I think sometimes we, we get frustrated in church leadership that we're doing all this work and nobody seems to notice, but we're kind of taking for granted that they should remember. And I think any leader's job is to be a chief reminding officer. So um, I think the more that we can remind people about the actions that we are trying to take based on the feedback we've heard, I think those three things are really important to rebuilding trust. Thank you, Dan. Bill, if I can ask you, just practically speaking, what needs to be happening in a, par in a parish finance council? Because there's a huge range. <laughs> I mean, just I've lived in a lot of different places and I, I've seen everything from the non-existence finance council, <clears throat> regardless of what canon law says. I've seen the um, finance council that just nods and smiles to the pastor. Uh, maybe he talks to them once a year or something. And then I've seen amazing finance councils. Can you tell us what does a good finance council look like, and how does it how how does that finance council share co responsibility with the pastor without t taking over the pastor's role? Those are great questions, and there's a lot to that. But let me let me kind of summarize on that. Um, first, I think um, you've got to have like with any council or any board, you got to have the right people with the right competencies. Um, and so that's part of where the gifts of the lady can really come into play, um, you know, because there's in any parish, there's going to be, you know, people in that parish who, who have all kinds of great skills who can, who can help. Um, but I'd also connect it though. Um, and by the way, that's one of the things I've been doing is um, trying to put together a way to train, equip and measure um, at the parish level, how well the councils are constructed, how well they know their role, um, and how well they operate, and and play that that co-shared responsibility role uh, with the parish and parish staff. The other really important thing is the connection, or in, in in fact, our archdiocese in our own guidelines says they want the the pastoral council and the finance council to be separate, distinct, but interdependent. Um, and I think that's really important because if you look at uh, again the the idea of transparency you've got, you really have to look at the stream of vision, direction, priorities, and then finances. And uh, without the priorities, the direction, and the vision, the finances don't have a lot of context. And so while canonically, the finance council does need to kind of stand on its own and be fairly, um, you know, it, it can't just be mushed into the, the pastoral council, those two councils do need, I think, to have a good interdependency and the vision should be um, uh, 
provided to the finance council to say, well, how can we fund that vision? How can we provide the resources for that vision? Um, and then there just, there again, needs to be good feedback going back between the two. What I find, and you know, something I'd like to pick up on what the Archbishop said and Dan said about relational. Um, my experience is good governance is 90% relational, 10% procedural. Most governance or a lot of governance and governance that doesn't work so well tries to flip that and try to make, tries to make it 90% procedural and 10% relational. It doesn't work. Good governance provides an environment of leaders of virtue and cultures of trust to thrive. And so to me, it really is important. I'm just finding at a lot of parish levels, um, while you have very good people, um, a ton of people to potentially pick from, I find the governing structures are not well laid out. There aren't the right guardrails so that lady can have shared responsibility in an appropriate canonically acceptable way in the governance of the parish. But if that's not, not laid out clearly, um, I think the, the pastor can get a bit nervous uh, uh, that this could get away from me. Um, and, and quite frankly, the lady start feeling that they are not being utilized or that their gifts are not being um, uh, expressed or used. And so the lady kind of check out uh, and then all of a sudden we're, we're, not, we're not bringing those gifts to the table and using them in unity and relation and collaboration with one another to help the parish achieve its mission and vision. Um, so I, I think real importantly is, is measurement um, and training. And so um, Pia, that's one of the things we'll, we'll probably do together down the road is um, I'm trying to create some good measurement uh, structure so that uh, there can be effective and efficient training uh, not just how to have a great pastoral council and a great finance council, but very importantly, how they connect and how they connect in the broader governing structure of the parish. And, you know, that can sound complex and to some level it is, but a good governing structure and system, once you've put it in place and, and, and are purposeful about it, it actually begins to work for you. A bad governing structure works against you and creates all kinds of inefficiency and quite frankly, I see it in business all the time. When governing systems aren't working well, the first thing that suffers is trust. And when trust starts deteriorating, um, usually good things don't happen. Thank you, Bill. Uh, your Excellency, you have, uh, I, I was really impressed to learn about your involvement in the oversight of finance councils. You've set up a special department in your diocese. Can you describe that department and the type of oversight that you have on the parish finance councils? Uh, you, you're, Pia, you're referring to two institutions or offices. One is I have uh, established an office which is the Pastoral Development Research Office. You know, in 2018, I had a pastoral visit to all parishes. Uh, considering the pastoral programs, the finances. So after the almost six months of pastoral visit, I established an office to prepare a comparative study, to study about the content and uh, some findings in view of the data. So for me, when I make a decision, I usually listen to my consultors, to, to people near, uh, the, close to the parish, and also to the, the, the result of the, the research. That's number one. The second, that in the Archdiocesan Finance Council, I instituted three oversight committees on investment, on policy, and also for the inventory or the expenses. So these three oversight committees in the Arsdiocesan in the Arsdiocesan Finance Council, they help me assess how we are going through the, the financial expenses, the income, the resources. So these are the two ways wherein I see, you see the balance between the pastoral life uh, as a product of the pastoral visit and the finances. You know, finances has an equivalence data to what you call program. It is not just a matter of program activities that we are without any money, nor money has a value in view of pastoral life. So 
when we spend wisely, it is because there is a program. And the program must be according to, to Bill and Dan, must be in accordance to the vision or to the objectives of the diocese. So in all parishes, this, the, the programs must be aligned in view of the, 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 um, the vision, the goals of the diocese, or else it's one its own way of doing it. Then at the end of the year, there is a need, there is already a tool to evaluate how we have spent the money, how we have uh, helped our people, how we have responded to the action of the Holy Spirit. And this we say, the pastoral life and the financial life of our diocese and the parish. So Pia, I, 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 you are referring to two things, the oversight committees in the Archdiocesan Finance Council, also with a research office, which I established after the pastoral visit. So I'd just like to follow up uh, with two more questions, Your Excellency. Well, actually one, um, no, two. <laughs> so my first question is, you read them, you have the minutes submitted of I, all of the finance councils and you review those. How usually, did you decide to do that? Usually, uh, I, I go back in 2019, I asked all the pastoral council to submit to be the minutes of the meeting. And I read those minutes and, and, and I underline what decisions have they made, one, and trying to see the priority of the parish. Is it for the poor? Is it for construction? So in usually the, uh, I, I read the minutes submitted to me by the pastoral council because there, you see the life of the parish, or else these are all just activities without any reference, especially to the poor people. And my second question is, you gather a lot of data. Do you make this public to everybody in the diocese? How do you, how do you, how do you publish this data? I issue a vademicum, a circular, an assessment of a, a data which could be beneficial to social services, to liturgy, to stewardship. So after studying the, the data, I would prepare a pastoral letter or exhortation in view of that. So uh, I, I go to the Catholic schools. I visited all our 36 Catholic schools. And you know, after the, the pastoral visit, then I prepared a pastoral exhortation for people to know. And, and I also give a seminar on what is really the content of that. It is a matter of owning the result. It is not just the bishop knows it. It is the matter of the principle of owning the problem and the solution in the direction. I think this is what you call the sharing of part of a partnership in this journey of faith. So when you look at church management, it's really a journey of faith between the bishop and the people of God, and of course, the people of God with Jesus. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. Uh, again, moving towards the more practical, maybe Bill or Dan, within the parish, what, do we, what needs to be measured and how, how do we measure it and who should do the measuring, just at a very practical level? Yeah, well, I'm sure Bill has, we both have lots to say on, on this one, I'm sure. You know, we, we uh, about eight years ago, we started a, um, a parish assessment tool called the Disciple Maker Index and trying to get at the spiritual health of the community. Um, and so a lot of people were telling us, you know, you can't measure that. And, and that, that mindset of you can't measure certain things is actually somewhat a front to accountability. It's not the, to say that the measurements are perfect or that they you know, um, uh, dictate, but, but you, can't, um, you can't attend to certain things if you don't have insight into where people are. So, um, you know, we're, we're now past 250,000 parishioners in 40 dioceses in 1,500 parishes, and, and what's come out of that is, is a real sense of where some of our gaps are as to where the people are in their understanding, beliefs, practices of the faith, and therefore where we should be putting maybe greater emphasis in some of our parishes. So, from my standpoint, again, um, money is somewhat easy to, to track, but, but are we tracking it against mission? You know, um, for, for parishes out there or anybody listening, one of the questions I would have 
is to think about you know, how often do we all talk about wanting more um, you know, engagement or evangelization of our young people. Um, how much money per child are we putting into that effort? If you broke it down based on what you might be spending per pupil in your Catholic school in, in the United States versus what you're investing in your religious education program for non-Catholic school families, there's a huge disparity there. And now that's not a, a conscious choice or a, um, and that's really the problem. It's not a conscious choice. Um, and so I think measurement gives us a way to be a little bit more conscious or, or informed uh, conscience uh, so that we can make better decisions. But I think it has to start with trying to measure um, the important things in, in the purpose of a Catholic parish, uh, which is uh, you know, bringing people closer to Christ, sending them out on mission to evangelize. Um, and, and we can ask questions of our people and we can look at uh, lots of different things uh, that we can track. Um, and I think it's just so, so important. I'm sure Bill, <laughs> Bill would, would agree. Absolutely. Bill, if I can just ask you, just before we get you, you jump in, if you could also include, um, how does the, where does the sacramental life of the parish come in? I mean, do you evaluate this? Is this one of the measurements that we're, that we're talking about? Because I think all of you have underscored, we're not just talking about money. So I'd like to talk about how does the sacramental life fit into these measurements? Because at the end of the day, the reason that we're concerned about stewarding these assets is for the salvation of souls. You, oh yeah, um, could, couldn't agree more. And, and again, I think that's why the, the idea of how we create a strong environment to govern that in, has a very strong laity aspect. So what's the pastoral council supposed to do? It's supposed to represent, it's supposed to be a visioning body on behalf of the parish. What does the parish need um, spiritually? What does the parish need to, to walk out the, the sacramental life uh, of the church? Um, so I think that is a, is a huge part, and, and that's why we can't bifurcate or separate the role of the pastor, the, pa the, the parish staff, and the council structure. They all have to work interdependently together. They're not meant to be divided and conquered. Um, but I'll tell you more specifically what I find and what we measure. So I've created an instrument called Council Vital Signs that gets very specifically to how councils uh, both pastoral, finance, school, all different types of councils, how they should be working. And, and uh, the first is clear roles. Um, and I find oftentimes there are not clear roles set up. Second, the right competencies. Now, oftentimes that's where everybody focuses. Oh, how do we get the right people who know about finances, who know about this, know about that? That's very important. But without clear roles, um, you're, you're, you're not going to be where you need to be. Then a strong process that everybody's trained in. Um, I work with boards all the time. If you just go get a bunch of really smart people and stick them in a room together where their role isn't clear and they don't have a strong process, it's going to be chaos. Um, the, the fourth is accountable measurement. It's Again, uh, let's face it, uh, we're not going to achieve those clear roles, right competency, strong process, unless we have accountable measurement. And then there's continuous improvement that happens. So I think one of the things that I think is really, really important is my, my opinion is of those things, role clarity tends to not be great um, in most of the parishes. They tend to have some of the right people, the right competencies, I think that's probably the strongest element. They do not have a strong process. They do not measure and there's no accountability for our, and, and to be honest, those measurements should be being done at every parish, um, not for the purpose of being punitive, but for the, for the purpose of continuous improvement and to give our bishops better, faster insight. Uh, you know, Archbishop, I, I heard you say in our prep session that um, how do I make decisions? You're an organizational development expert. You say, how do I make decisions without data? Um, that's very, very true. And, and I think most bishops today have a very large span of, uh, of parishes that they have to oversee. And without the right kind of uh, governing structures happening at the ground level, and with the right, right kind of data coming back, I don't know how uh, you know someone in your seat is able to pinpoint where are the training needs, where are the the pastors that need some of of your um, uh, counseling and, and coaching, and um, and where can the uh, the councils again the councils are really here to 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 share some responsibility 
um, in the visioning and in the governing of the parish in canonically consistent ways, not to get in the uh, in between the pastor and the bishop. That 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 can never happen. So I really think it it comes down to putting in some accountable measurement and a continuous improvement mindset. And I think there are absolutely mechanisms around training and a toolbox and data um, that um, people like Dan and, and myself could could absolutely uh, you know uh, help bring to the table. I think there has to be a bit more accountability by pastors though to say um, this is important and 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 I, I believe the accountable measurement shouldn't really be an option. It should be something that every 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 leader of virtue should want good accountable measurement and good transparency. And so yeah, can, I think we have to make it part of what the church does. And Pia, if I can just put a point on what Bill's saying, because I think some of the things he, he mentioned are really important for another reason too, which is my experience of working with parish or diocesan finance councils. Oftentimes, as Bill said, they have really, really talented people who are on them. But what happens is not, the, um, not in the big moments, but really in the small moments is where it falls apart in that... Um, you know, father gives out the, the, the statement of accounts or, or whatever the activities are for that year, for that, that period. And, and somebody has like a twinge inside them that they're saying, I don't think this looks right, right? But, but if they don't understand their role, to Bill's point, if, if they don't have a process to follow and they're not sure, like, and they haven't had any preparation to say, is this when I'm supposed to say something or is it not? Even these titans of industry that I've seen they just kind of remain silent and, and then they get maybe discouraged as I think somebody mentioned. So, so it's really, I think for anybody listening, it, it's the small moments where it falls apart because people don't feel like they understand what they're supposed to do. And, and they, they're almost surprised by the situation. And in the moment, they don't do what they, what their role is really asking them to do. So I think the things that Bill's talking about, the, 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 the role clarity, the process and the measurement give people the, the tools and the, the courage to kind of say, make that point. Because in many cases, what I observe, it's not um, intentional malfeasance on the part of our pastors or our councils. It's just kind of this awkward dynamic that it's like, well, I do this in my job, but does it work the same way in the church? I don't know. And, and, and so we need to help people kind of along to have that little bit of confidence to, to make those observations that they definitely can make, but, but need to know that it's their role to make them. Dan, I just want to completely uh, agree with what you just said. It is in those small moments. And again, in all the work that I do with corporate boards, there, there can be in the same dynamic, there can be, believe it or not, a little bit of intimidation, uh, one with your fellow board members, but also to the CEO, or in this case, the pastor, who knows so much more about kind of, you know, what's going on day to day, that they feel like, am I going to look stupid if I raise this issue? That's a training issue. Uh, and it's quite also, uh, I'll, I'll be real honest, what I see on most uh, boards is if either the board chair or, or the CEO sets the tone to say, there is no stupid question. We are here to help lift each other up. And usually it is those questions where somebody kind of goes, something just isn't setting right in, in my spirit here. That is often where the big aha comes from. And I tell you, if you don't get it right in small moments, you won't get it right in the big moments either. So well said, Dan, that's an excellent point. Thank you both Bill and Dan for, uh, for these important contributions. We are running against the clock as usual. The conversation always gets going. Um, we, we're never lacking for things to cover and we have a list of questions, but before we go to that, I'd like to give each of you a chance, kind of a two minute or less than two minutes if you can, um, to just give your final thoughts on this matter. Archbishop, if we could start with you. We have to be grateful to the Lord for entrusting gifts and we are good stewards of that. <clears throat> so it is very important that uh, in any uh, responsibility, the attitude of gratefulness must be part of our life. <clears throat> because we have been entrusted by the Lord. And uh, definitely, whether you are a finance officer, a bishop, a priest, a religious, one thing is <clears throat> the Lord has entrusted something to your care, and you have to take care of that. At the end of our life, there is only one person who's going to ask our transparency. How have we done 
to the blessings entrusted to us. So I, I think it revolves around that. At the end of the day, it is the Lord who owns our life, who owns the parish, and who is the giver of good things. Thank you, Your Excellency. Dan. Yeah, I, I want, I mean, that's beautifully said, uh, Archbishop, and, and I don't know that I can add a lot more just to say to everybody that, that um, structures alone, policies alone will not do anything. They don't, they don't animate, they can't uh, correct. They, they, they are helpful tools, but they are just that, they are tools. And so um, it, leaders are what matter and leaders are what make tools work or not work. Um, and so uh, whether, whether we are the pastor um, or we are uh, a member of a finance council, I think we have a really big responsibility to do whatever we can do to be a self-leader um, and to get the training that we feel like we need, to have the courage to say the things we need to say, even if it's a little uncomfortable, but to do so out of that spirit that Archbishop mentioned, one of gratitude, one of these gifts do not belong to us. Um, we are their, their temporary stewards and we are grateful for them. And that's the spirit in which we make our decisions and our actions. Thank you, Dan. And to Bill. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm a big believer that a, uh, um, a picture's worth a thousand words. So I'm gonna just share something really quick here with, with everybody. And I'm, and I'm not going to, um, uh, I'm just gonna talk about a piece of it here, but it's a, it's a really big part. And, and hopefully in the recording, if anyone's interested in this, you can take a closer look at this, but I'm gonna just emphasize a couple of things that have been said. R really, I, I just, I love um, a, a scripture out of Isaiah, Isaiah 49 about being a polished arrow in the Lord's quiver. And um, so what I'd like to just share here is this idea of um, that uh, this, whole, this whole idea of transparency and, and governance is very human, uh, but we are really, to the archbishop's point, we're a vessel for, for God's authority. So there's a covenant aspect um, to the source of that power, which again, in this analogy is of course God, um, but there's also a stewardship that we are, uh, we are doing things um, in accordance with with God's will uh, with those things. And so, as I mentioned before, uh, this idea of um, uh, leaders of virtue, uh, and you know, you, you have, and again, I, I do this in the secular world all the time. Uh, uh, maybe you can see that the cardinal virtues there in more Catholic language, but it's about wisdom, courage, discipline, and equity um, in, in the model uh, of our savior, Jesus Christ kind of like the fletching of an arrow, the shaft of an arrow, much like cultures of trust. We talked about stewardship, integrity, accountability, transparency in the model of Beatitudes. But those structures of integrity, and Dan's absolutely right, uh, structures alone are nothing. You have to have the leaders of virtue and the cultures of trust. But I will also tell you, without the structure of, uh, structures of integrity, cultures of trust and leaders of virtue can't thrive. So at a parish level, uh, and again, we won't go into this deeply because we don't have time, but um, the oversight role, execution role, verification role are the three pieces of structures of integrity. And wouldn't you know it, they kind of follow God's nature, the nature of the Trinity. So you have the bishop, the pastor, the councils, in my opinion, are kind of the weak link of this picture. And if, again, structures of integrity are not the dog, but they, they you know, the, they, um, you need structures of integrity um, for this whole thing to work. And so, uh, I find uh, councils are in the training and the data around this are really important so we can drive the transparency we're talking about. But anyway, I, I use different versions of this. Uh, this version I use with parishes, but uh, there's a version of this that doesn't have um, necessarily the spiritual language on it that I'm able to use out in the secular world as well, because leaders of virtue, cultures of trust, and structures of integrity matter no matter what kind of organization we're talking about, but especially matters um, in our Catholic organization. So I, want, I just wanted to share this visual because I, I really use it a lot um, and I find a lot of people um, resonate with it. So I just wanted to share that as part of what, what I wanted to uh, say at the end here. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. We will be um, posting at the, on our website the slide as well, Bill's slide for people. And I just wanna let all of our participants know, we are building out a page for each of the webinars with more resources. Uh, the questions that we can't answer, we're doing our best to answer them. Uh, and this is gonna be kind of a long-term project to make, the, make our 
the, the page is very resource heavy for you because we know this is a short amount of time. I just want, there's a question, we have a lot of questions. Somebody asked about what we're doing with uh, theology students, particularly seminarians, how to prepare them. The Archbishop gave some practical uh, recommendations that he implements. I do wanna mention that Global Institute, we are partnering with um, a seminary right now to develop a program so that during the pastoral year, because the seminarians typically when they're in their academic cycles, they have more than enough on their plate between academics and formation. We are trying to develop um, a program so that during the pastoral year, when they're in a parish, they begin to become familiar with some of these best practices. Um, it, it, so stay tuned. We hope to be able to announce more about that in, in the near future. Turning to the questions, again, we have several questions. This is, I want to ask our panelists, and you can kind of, there's two sides to this question. One is, what if your pastor is um, in the par parish is not compliant, doesn't follow some of these best practices, is not transparent, doesn't, you know, work well with the councils, maybe doesn't even have a council. And the flip side of that is how do you foster a culture of transparency, either as a, a cleric or a lay person? So our, I'll leave that to whoever on the panel would like to take that up. Well, I, I, maybe on the first side, I, I um, and this is maybe a larger question around just feedback in general. Um, I, I find that we uh, in the church are terrible with feedback. So, um, I, and I think particularly the laity are terrible with feedback. So, and, and our priests, you know, one of the things we've, we've tried to do in our training is to give priests some skills to, and competence to solicit feedback so that they're getting it, but oftentimes they're not getting any feedback. So father may have been in ministry for 20 years and has never gotten feedback. He doesn't have a mechanism like what archbishops describe, which I think is excellent. So he's gone his whole entire priesthood without ever kind of getting any type of sense of if he's on track, off track, you know, et cetera. Um, so I think one of the things that I would just say and encourage people to do is if your pastor is kind of non-compliant on anything, assume benign intent first. Um, assume in the best sense that he might just be ignorant or, or in the best sense, or that he might not know that he's supposed to be doing something. And so you have an opportunity as somebody who does know to, to share that knowledge. So um, I always kind of reference the Matthew principle, right? You, you wanna go and have that conversation with your brother before you go and, and bring somebody else in, right? I think oftentimes we jump to, you know, no feedback to angry letter to the bishop, right? And now what we've done is we've kind of escalated the situation to a point where there's only kind of one way that it can end. And, and that's unfortunate, I think, in many cases. So I think to really try and initiate some very charitable and, and calm conversations with your pastor in a spirit of help, like, how can I help you, Father, do this or, or be a part of that? If he's really resistant, then I, I do think we have to raise those types of concerns, especially if there's really something significant that you believe is going on. I think we, we've, we've seen as a church, if we don't say something when we see something, uh, that that's a problem. So, uh, but I think we have to start with a with a, a assuming benign intent, assuming a charitable approach and, and engaging in that courageously, even if it's a little uncomfortable to just say, I think we might wanna look into this or that. A lot of times we just kind of totally skip that step and then things become uh, much worse, uh, and it, it didn't necessarily have to be that way. Yeah, but I, I, I agree with everything Dan said. I'd add maybe the other perspective, and I, I think that diocese, a lot of what the archbishop is doing and talking about, I think the archdiocese need to establish centers of excellence that really uh, focus in on the tools and the measurement um, to help the parishes do these things. But at the end of the day, um, I really think the bishops um, and I'd be interested in the archbishop's view on this, but I think the bishops need to step up and be clear to their priests and their pastors that this is expected. Um, you, uh, parish governance is important. Uh, these councils are important. And um, just like our archbishop here is, um, I'm gonna hold you accountable for that. Um, I'm, I'm looking at these things and I'm gonna expect these things because the bottom line is it's very hard for a, a member of a parish alone to go talk to a pastor and say, hey, you're not doing the things you should here and you don't have the right counsels. And uh, I, I, I think uh, the, the kind of good top down, bottom up, um, but it's, it's to support each other. It's to make sure all this works well together. 
but I, I do think it's extremely important that the bishops um, begin uh, or, or continue to be very clear that these are things that will need to be expected if we're going to regain the trust uh, back in um, externally and internally again to our church. Your Excellency, could you jump in? I have four points which I could uh, offer. Number one is I wish to recall uh, during my pastoral visit, particularly for the reporting of the finance, I would ask the parish to present a pie analysis. You know what is pie analysis? The, it's a pie, then you divide it percentage wise. And I asked Father, how come that you have no pastoral life? How come that all expense goes to this one, to, to, to the food? Where is the pastoral life? I, I, I asked him, I asked him to look at the pie, the analysis based on a diagram. And, and the, the priest would say, next time, Bishop, I'm going to check whether we, we have a budget for that and we are going to give more time for our pastoral life. The second is maybe ask the parish priests to present a monthly report of expenses and uh, the, the money that uh, comes. The third one is if the priest is not transparent, you could ask a friend of him, a priest too, to talk to the priests or to the life group. You know, in, the, in my archdiocese, we have a life group, friends of the priests who would tell him, Father, you know, this is your situation today. And lastly, the auditing office. If the auditing office in your diocese could report a, a quarterly analysis of how the money is spent. These are just practical things where in little by little, we could help our priests really see that the money is not theirs. It is to be spent for the pastoral life and for, for the whole parish. So it's not for oneself. So these are just practical means of trying to help our parish priests to be transparent and to, to be fluid in what you call relationship with our people. And thank you, Your Excellency. If I could follow up with another question for you. Um, we've gotten different vari variations of this question, but in parishes that receive money that are in mission um, countries that receive money from outside sources, uh, let's say they have an appeals in the United States or the UK. What, uh, how do you implement a transparency structure so that it, they're transparent about the money that it's not money that's coming from their parishioners per se, but money that's coming from mission, other mission organizations or appeals? Before I became a parish, a, a bishop, I was the representative of the Vatican in what you call pontifical mission societies. You know, this is under propaganda fee day, uh, distributing funds, especially for poor countries. And uh, we ask reports in view of how they spent and they cannot ask for another grant if they have not submitted the said request. You know, in the Philippines, when I was the director of the Pontifical Mission Societies, I used to really check the previous project if they are faithful to the, the project proposal, to the expenses, and I asked receipts on that. So I think um, accountability of this person must be um, emphasized, particularly those responsible in the area. So you're, you're referring to mission countries. So definitely it's the bishop because you cannot get money from an outside without the endorsement of the bishop. And we hope that the bishop would also check the project, even, even the content of the project. It's, it's not a copy paste project. It must be a real, realistic project because we know that there are some copy paste project. Actually, it's diverted to another project. So let us, let's, I, I think let us be realistic about this. So I go back to the responsibility of the bishop since it's about the country, it's about, about the mission territory that the bishop is accountable to the funding agency, be it Miserior, Propaganda Fide, or Curtsy Notes. So I think very important is the, the image 
of the diocese or the image of the parish in view of transparency in the finances. Uh, I want to thank you all. I want to offer to you just a really practical uh, practice that I saw in a parish that I was part of. Um, the, it was either every month or every quarter, the bishop, the, excuse me, the pastor would just include a simple financial statement in the bulletin. And so you knew what had come in, what had gone out and where had, it had gone generally. And then he would budget with the team, with his parish council and finance council for the next year. And if anything was, um, if they wanted to increase the budget, then he would have, you know, some meet and greet evenings, wine and cheese evenings with the, the parish to explain it. If the financial commitments were not there by the end of the year for the new fiscal year, the projects wouldn't go forward. But the thing was, everybody knew, and, and it was amazing because it was a blue collar parish. And so in, in other words, not a wealthy parish that accomplished tremendous things simply because people could see and understand where their money was going. Anyway, uh, again, I wanna thank all of our participants, uh, Bill Bojan, Dan Salucci, and Archbishop Garcetta, particularly Archbishop, I know it's very late in the Philippines. Um, thank you for ending your day with us. And I just wanna remind everyone, we three things, we have next month's webinar, Financial Transparency for Religious Orders on April 8th at 4 p.m. Rome time. You can um, get in from, you can register both at the GICM.org website or at the PCM website. Also next week, March 15th, we uh, start a part, we have a partnership with EWTN to offer a five part reflection series on St. Joseph. You can check EWTN website for the local times and uh, we will be also hosting those videos on our website at Global Institute after they've been aired. Um, lastly, but not least, not least in importance is that enrollment is open for PCM's fifth edition in Rome, and that starts September 2021, finishes May 2022, and our intensive sessions for executives have been posted. Those are um, in September. They're the same programs that the Archbishop did and also that I did when I was Chancellor for the Diocese of Orange. So again, thank you to all of you for your participation and for uh, being part of this important discussion. And we look forward to seeing you next month for the next webinar. And as I said, we'll be incorporating as many of the questions as we can into our the pages where we host the webinars. But again, thank you all, both to our participants and to those of you who attended. Have a good evening or a good day. Thank you.